I'm Tycho, and these are Fighting Words. And in a podcast all about fighting, what is more fight-like than a war? A war set, perhaps, in the stars. So, today we're going to talk about... We've, we've talked before about things that work, mods that work, uh, games that work, things things we like when they work. So we wanted to talk about when Star Wars works well, and maybe what we can draw from that success in terms of how games are run and planned. And, and oh lord, is there a dichotomy from when Star Wars works and when Star Wars does not work? It uh, is It is a steep, steep line. There is very little mediocre. <laughs> There's very little in that falls in the, in the middle. There's just a lot of suck and a lot of good. So we're gonna we're gonna limit ourselves today. We're not gonna talk about everything because we we do sleep on occasion. Um, our our scales need time to. Re- I mean, our skin skin human skin <laughs> needs time to refresh itself. So we we do sleep sometimes. So we're not gonna talk about the books. We're not gonna talk about the games. There's just too much. And honestly, I still haven't even figured out what is and isn't canon anymore. And I'm beyond caring. In in the Star Wars game that my friends and I play in, we've decided that we're using canon as a suggestion only. It's the only way to stay sane. And and that's and that's what you should do. Uh, because well, first off, the people who actually write the damn thing don't give a shit. Um and it's true. Just just retcon whenever and wherever they feel like. So uh so why the fuck not? Um and a lot of it's just shit. <laughs> um, honest to God, the best thing that came out of the 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 uh, the sequel trilogy was when they told when they let it drop that the EU was now no longer canon, and the massive tantrum that got thrown when that happened. That was hilarious. And then they started um, replacing it with watered down versions of a lot of the same <laughs> books, and I just don't know why they bothered. But we're not talking about the books or this is going to become a three-hour presentation on why old thrawn is better than new thrawn and no one cares how many times can you recycle the death star concept let me tell you how many times we can (laughs) recycle we can recycle it at least once for episode seven i tell you what uh all right so let's start talking about (laughs) before we start being uh, angry (laughs) and, and slagging slagging uh oh i've never i've never seen episode nine yet because i stopped giving a shit Um, honestly we're not even going to talk about episode nine because either you think it worked and you're wrong or you know why it didn't work and you really don't need us to tell you why it didn't work yeah um both sides of the fandom pro and con just just put me off star wars so much that i just stopped giving a shit um we even have disney plus i still haven't watched it i just don't care um So let's talk about Star Wars media that works, that we like. What's your top three? Oh, goodness. Um, Top three is probably Clone Wars, Mando, and Rogue One in no particular order. I think Clone Wars and Mando are fighting for the top spot. Um, I do like Rogue One, but I don't think I like Rogue One more than Clone Wars or Mando. And that's not really a fair comparison. Because there's a whole hell of a lot more going on in both Clone Wars and Mando than there was in Rogue One. And Rogue One was a little bit hampered by um, the main character being so remarkably bland. Um, and ha- having the really cool bit characters kind of relegated to the the deep sidelines. But it was still a slice of the universe that I was interested in and enjoyed seeing. Um, so that would be my top three. What what would you peg as a top three if it's not the same thing? Um, I would probably, I would probably, uh, and we might stop being friends after this. You're going to say episode eight is is in your top three. No, no, no. Oh my God. No. Um, I mean, my loyalty for, to Laura Dern, um, goes far and runs deep because God knows Ellie Statler was a, uh, was an awakening for young Ray. <laughs> <laughs> um, but she's not dealing with Jurassic Park here. So, uh, and uh, her character in Star Wars sucked, frankly. Um, no, I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to say episode four instead of uh, Clone Wars. And it's a close run thing, uh, but it's a stylistic choice. I, um, I can see that on, on stylistic merit. Um, yeah. I, I, 
I, yeah, I think, I think Clone Wars tells better stories. Mm-hmm. Um, and has more time to explore interesting shit, but episode four is paced almost perfectly. Like you don't have a chance to breathe. They're throwing so much shit at you. Um, and uh, one thing that runs through all, all three of my favorites is I like Star Wars best when it's hard Scrabble. Um, yeah, I, I think I think it works best where yeah, there's high technology, but most of it's broken and we're basically <laughs> we're scavenging a ship that crashed here 30 years ago. Uh, some people somewhere might make these things new, but we certainly can't. You know, we're still riding around on shaggy elephants. <laughs> like, and I think that that really works for me. That's a, uh, that's one thing I like about that. This idea that there's technology, but the technology is almost as mystic as the force. It's, well, and even the technology that exists isn't a magical cure-all. You still have logistics and distribution and things like that that make it so that on a planet like Tatooine, which is, I think, not quite the Outer Rim, but it, it's... No, no, Tatooine is, is an Outer Rim planet, I, I'm pretty sure. But you're on an Outer Rim planet. You're very far from the core, which is where all the civilization happens. And you just don't get too many Amazon trucks coming by your side of the galaxy. It just, they don't go there. Um... And just that that exploration is is pretty neat. And you're right, episode four is paced very well. And it's there's something to be said for how well it comes off, considering that it was the first step off the diving board, as it were. So I don't disagree with with that. Um, but you would say uh, Rogue One, episode four, and Mando. Yeah. Um. Just because, like I said, Clone Wars tells really interesting stories, but. It's a different feel when when your protagonists are agents of a, a very well funded and well supplied entity. Um, right. You know, it, it just there is a certain there is a certain care. Sorry, your audio just cut out. Oh, sorry. Um, I was saying there's there there's a certain carelessness among the the Jedi, even the conscientious Jedi, like the the good Jedi commanders. Um, like, you know, oh, you know, we wrecked all this equipment. It doesn't really matter because we have starships full of this same, this, we, you know, we have starships full of this stuff. Um, like, I don't know. It loses something. Um, yeah, there are hard, hard scrabble moments in the Clone Wars, but they're usually, um, they're, they're a microcosm. So like, um, I was talking before the, where we started recording the uh the blockade of ryloth was they they didn't have a lot of troops to devote to it so it was a small group that got sent in and they were dealing with um a lot of limited equipment um and the fact that they were basically trying to reinforce a almost civilian resistance so but again uh as a whole you're dealing with the republic it is it is the the monolith the the, the giant um, and the giant as a protagonist is hard to make as interesting as, you know, the, the underdog. I mean, it's just a different feel. Um, yeah, it's, it's, and it's not, and I don't, it's hard to even say that because, you know, the protagonist, it, it, what happens is I think the difference is when you, when you have the protagonists being a part of the monolith, then the protagonist antagonist dynamic shifts inside to the internal workings of the monolith um like in the clone wars apart from maybe one or two sequences there's never really a doubt that the the trade federation is just going to get ground down like you know it needs to be done they need to chase them all across the outer rim but you know it's it's... there's always that underlying assumption that this war ends when we catch grievous because that is the inevitable outcome of of this chain of events yeah um <clears throat> and i just think the i just think the group kind of struggling and together you know the bits and pieces of technology that they can is just a, a more a more compelling story like it's more i don't know uh it's just it's more interesting to me uh i think because it's 
it introduces more complications, um, more natural complications to the story. Uh, it, it introduces, it throws in a lot of hard choices. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons where that, that Rogue One works so well. Um, you know, there's a real sense of opportunity cost in Rogue One. Mm-hmm. Um, every, every action, every time you enter a door that closes several other doors. Um, and I like that in narrative. It's interesting that um, you ranked four above Clone Wars because of the, the Rebels being a bit more hard scrabble, but I I don't list Rebels as being higher because even though it's, you could compare it to Clone Wars, but with a smaller group and less resources, but I still found Rebels less interesting because the the tone overall was just less less serious and less dire most of the time. So it, it almost kind of lost that that threat that was always present in Clone Wars of the the people you're watching have a very good chance to die. Like there's not much concern for the outcome in Rebels because it was it was a much more theme park experience if that makes sense. No, you're you're right. And uh, I, honest to God, Rebels hadn't even pinged because it's set dressing in Rebels. Yeah. Um. Yeah. You know, no one's gonna die because they run out of oxygen. Clone Wars would pull that shit. Clone well, Wars did pull that shit. They, yeah. they they spaced a bunch of of troopers in like the second episode. <laughs> um. You know, uh, Mando would pull that shit. Um. But rebels, rebels would rebels would hold back, and you'd know rebels was holding back. So. Mm. Rebels didn't. Rebel, Rebels really didn't do anything for me. Um, it wasn't bad, but it wasn't. That was one of the ones, one of the rare Star Wars properties that's just kind of, eh. like, the the best thing to come out of Rebels for me was the fact that Lars Mikkelsen is now officially the voice of Thrawn, and he does a very good job. There but apart some, from that, <laughs> there were some good lightsaber fights. Uh, maybe in terms of the movement, I guess, like the, the choreography, it, I just oh, never yeah, got yeah. over the weird pencil thin lightsaber aesthetic they had in rebels it, that, that kind of threw me off. Um, they, they did, they didn't, they didn't build up the emotion, um, enough for me. Uh, and that's what I meant from like a technical, the yeah. moves they're doing standpoint. And, um, I, and I gotta say, I appreciate any, any, any media that gives Vader his due. Yes, they, uh, they they did do that. Um, and Rebels absolutely gave Vader his due. Um, it's it's that's one of the reasons that scene alone, uh, Vader in the hallway, um, would have put Rogue One on the, this list all by itself. Because uh, holy shit, you know, by by the time you're at Episode Six, you're kind of wondering what the big deal with this doofus is. Um, <laughs> and, and I, re- I, I think if <laughs> if you don't count the Death Star firing as him pulling the trigger, because it was Tarkin giving the order, and there was you know a whole chain of technicians pulling handles. So if you don't count Alderaan among his kill count, Darth Vader killed more people in that hallway than he killed in the entire four, five, and six put together. With with oh. personally, well, most of them are on the same team. He's yeah, TKing. he's TKing most of the time. <laughs> He gets most of his kills in episode five when people give him bad news. That is the majority of Darth Vader's kill count. How many how many pilots does he shoot down in episode four? Maybe three. I think, I think he I was gonna say two or three. Like it's yeah. not many. A, lo- a lot of guys eat turbo laser blasts from those from those defense towers. Um and there are two other TIE fighters in the mix and they do take some shots as well, I think. So yeah, Vader's kill count, um, not looking too good if you just watch the original trilogy. So you're right. You get to episode six, like, all right, so he wears black. I get it. And his ship is the size of Rhode Island. That's cool. But like, why? I don't get it. Why? And then you see Rogue One, you say, that's, that's why. Okay. I that's see, why. I see that, that the thing where he cuts up 30 dudes in a hallway, that, that's why, that's why he's scary. <laughs> and like, and like, yeah, you know, he kicks around Luke, but like, I'm pretty sure everyone in the theater kind of goes, well, if I had a lightsaber, I could probably kick around Mark Hamill too. A lot of people I'm... kick around Luke. Luke kicks around <laughs> Luke in the sequel trilogy. <laughs> oh, um, I guess I'll just die on a cliff. 
<laughs> I'm just that 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 uh all right, so uh so the the one of the few good things about uh episode eight was the um the uh the siren milk <laughs> and Mark Hamill's expression after drinking the siren milk uh of a man who ha- who has lost every fuck that he ever possessed. <laughs> They were in the cargo compartment of my X-Wing. It's underwater now. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so yeah, just, just, just Rogue One, just for making Vader actually a, a legitimate threat. Um, that in and of itself would, would catapult it to the, the top, but the rest of it's really good anyway. They also gave him such an Anakin line in telling Krennic not to choke on his aspirations. Oh my god. That was such an Anakin line. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I like that they I like that they nailed his sense of Anakin Skywalker's sense of drama and his need to build a a, a, a an evil palace on the lava planet where he was mostly incinerated. Um, and then to, and then to use that palace as that, that, that's where the Anakin to tell really bad puns. <laughs> that's where he puts his spa. That That's peak Anakin. That's just, just, yeah, this is the same dude. This is the same motherfucker. <laughs> All right. So rogue one is one that, that we both agree worked. So let's, let's drill down as to why, um, I think it does go back in part to, like you said earlier, that, that hard scrabble existence where, we're seeing a very different side of, of the rebel Alliance than we see in episode four, um, five and six as well, but four is our introduction to the rebel Alliance. And uh, it, there's nothing all that remarkable about it. Um, They're under equipped. Sure. But uh, apart from that, I mean, they're not given a lot of flavor in universe in episode four, except that they are the not empire. There's the Empire and the not Empire, and this is the not Empire. Yeah, uh, when you have when when one side is the people who blow up planets, um, I mean that kind of covers the characterization for everybody. Uh, team not blow up planets. Hello there. We didn't just destroy an entire world. Ah, I'll be joining you then. Your retirement plan must be better. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I actually. I like that it touches on the fact that the the Rebel Alliance has a bunch of different factions and that those factions have a bunch of different um, approaches to, you know, being rebels. Um, And I know this is built on a lot of uh, a lot of backstory work that was done in the Rebel series and in Clone Wars, I think. Yeah, uh, the character Saw Gerrera goes all the way back to Clone Wars, where he was basically the equivalent of uh, someone in South Vietnam after we dropped in some green berets to tell them which end of an AK goes bang. And then he, uh, he just kind of grew and developed from there into Forrest Whitaker. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was kind of a, an IRA hardliner versus Sinn Féin kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, yeah. That's what I was thinking. Cause yeah, we, they, they had his sister, right? Yes, uh, his sister did not survive the Clone Wars, and that kind of started him down the uh, the path to being a rampant radical terrorist. And uh, he does appear a bit in Rebels, not maybe not quite as far along as he was in in Rogue One, but you definitely see what direction he's headed. And he does not get along with um, specifically uh, Captain Herrera or any of the other uh, or. Not Herrera, Her- Hera Sindela. He doesn't get along with Captain Sindela or really any of the other um, rebel officers. He kind of has, like you said, he has his own faction. They have their way of doing things. And the theme park uh, rebel crew of the Ghost really don't get along with car bombing Her- uh, with car bombing Saw Gerrera <laughs> and his, his buddies. <laughs> The Virgin Mary blesses my armalite. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh. Right now is not the time to start singing Come Out You Black and Tans. I know you want to. 
uh, yeah. Uh, so, so I, I appreciate that. Um, like, it's nice to see the raw edge of the conflict. Uh, like, it's nice to see it outside of the outside of the X wing cockpit. And that's that's kind of one of the things I like. It gets onto a more a granular a granular level, um, and you do still see some of it from an X wing cockpit. But I mean, you're right. When we look at four, five, and six, most of the actual war we see is is ship to ship combat, or I mean, or teddy or teddy bears or teddy bears. Right. I mean, you get some shootouts in corridors. Um, that doesn't really qualify as like war movie material to me. The the um, rebels are so bad at fighting in corridors, and well, yes, they're they're awful at it. <laughs> it's, it. It's the one place where stormtroopers' accuracy can come into play because, I mean, on a long enough time scale, you fire enough bolts, you're bound to clear the hallway. <laughs> that's that's very true. Um, yeah, just the the rebel alliance gets its ass kicked in hallways all the time. Um, but it's like the the big battle scene in Episode Four was was the trench run. Mm-hmm. Um, we have, we get one planetary battle that, that almost, I mean, you, you have the snow speeder attack on the at but like the at assault itself isn't really an interactive combat. Like you, you see the rebels firing back, but you see it not doing anything. So it, it's kind of like a token resistance while they wait for the transports to lift off, which is, I mean, that in and of itself is, is neat. It's almost like Hoth is the rebels Dunkirk, if that makes sense. Oh no, it hundred percent and it's neat and it's a good it's a good setup and i really one of the things i appreciate about empire is you you don't really see that kind of setup all that frequently in film where the protagonist faction has to fight a a a delaying action in a in a retreat in a deliberate retreat like there is no are, way we can win this they are just getting there at like and it was I, one of the things that sold me on it was as soon as the as soon as the Imperials break, um, what is it? It's not warp, is it? Break Hi- hyperspace. Hyperspace, yeah. Uh, as soon as the Imperials break hyperspace, Rebel Command is like, oh, we're leaving. <laughs> we're not even going to wait and see how many there are. Like, we're not going to do a force analysis. We know they have enough. Yeah. Um, but again, all the action is happening on the macro level. The only thing that even gave the the walkers a, a little bit of a trouble was the snow speeder attack. Um, and still when we see, uh, I think it's captain veers in the cockpit of the lead AT AT. He is entirely unconcerned. Yeah. Like, he, oh. he, he's not, he's not looking, he's not telling his gunners, you know, target the snow. He doesn't care. He's just walking ahead. He sees the generator. And as soon as he's within that, what, like a two and a half kilometer range, he's going to pull that trigger and it's game over. Yeah. Um, and it's a cool sequence in its own right, but it's, it's, it's again, it's not, it's most of it's vehicular um, because it's either centered around the snow speeders or watching the, watching the at slog their way through, you know, the paltry rebel defenses, just completely unconcerned. Um, and then it's a massacre in the hallways. Like there isn't, it just, it doesn't have, I don't know. Um, and there's not even any any fight on the way out. The X-Wings are just escorting the transport so they don't get lost. They they know there's no point in trying to stay and, and drop a torpedo or something. Just, nope, we're going to hit the, the destroyers with an ion cannon so they can't shoot you, and you're just going to run. Just yeah. grab it. <laughs> and, and, it's, and it's a great sequence for that, but it's just, it's different than a back and forth where, the action of the battle is is part of the narrative. Right. The closest um, we get to that in the original is in episode six, where we have a simultaneous ground attack and space combat going on. And you do see a decent bit of both. Um, but I would still say that, that Rogue One is, is much better at doing the, 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 the combined arms combat and, and giving you a better view of it. I hate the Andor sequence. It's it's not a good it's not a good battle scene. The the speeders through the forest was fun. I yes. liked the speeders through the forest. That was awesome. Uh but like honestly when you have the stormtroopers and their fucking 
combat walkers do a job for a bunch of three foot tall teddy bears. That makes everyone look like shit. Like, how did these, you know, how did a bunch of Stone Age koalas kick the shit out of a Stormtrooper Legion that had previously captured all of the good guys? And never mind the the fact that this this was the Stormtrooper Legion assigned to guard the shield facility that is protecting the Death Star, where the Emperor is sitting personally. That this this was, I think it may have actually been, canonically speaking, the five hundred first, which is like the elite stormtrooper unit. The, these are people who know their job; they know what they're doing. Um, but they lost to the teddy bears. Yeah. Um, it it, it 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 strains it, it, your belief. It, cheap, it cheapens the whole. It cheapens everybody. Like. It just cheapens everybody. Um, I mean, at this point, like, if I was the New Republic, I would just be stuffing boarding torpedoes full of Ewoks <laughs> and just shooting them at anything I didn't like. Because clearly, you can't <laughs> handle the Teddy. <laughs> and and I and I bet you could fit a lot of them in. Oh yes, <laughs> just, just just pack them in. <laughs> um, that transport can't carry any more than five or six people. <laughs> Yub yub commences. (laughs) Twenty seven yub yubs later. (laughs) Um, but yeah, like, so so for me that that did not do anything. Like, that's just oh gosh, it's just cringe. Um, so Rogue One, I I think, is the first time. I mean, so. I just realized we're glossing over the prequels because we do get a lot of that big <sighs> battle scene in the prequels. But even that's not all quality. Um, the Battle of Theed was is a little bit hampered by their over-reliance on some very dated CGI for the, the Gungans and the the. Oh, oh I was going to ask, is that the Gungan fight? Yeah. The Gungan fight is is not great. Um, it's too slapstick for me. Yeah, that's the problem. That's the problem with all the with all the ground combat in in the prequels. They couldn't they couldn't help stop themselves from turning it into slapstick. In and the first like, one, yeah. The second one, they tried, but they did poorly because all of the clone troopers they didn't move like people whose job was killing people. They moved like people whose job was animating other people who move. <laughs> um like i think i remember hearing in a commentary somewhere that they actually brought on people whose job was to kill people for mocap in the third movie and you can tell because the clone troopers move a lot more proficiently in the third movie but in the second movie they move like animation engineers uh they they don't move like they know what guns are you know what i, I will say this about the prequels um <sighs> What's the what's the 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 four legged thing with two guns that has a personal shield? Is that a droidka? Yes, the droidka. Yeah. Um, anytime a droidka rolls out, I sat up in, in the prequels. They handled them spectacularly, Ma- making them an actual like existential threat to the Jedi. Yeah, and, and like, well, just because the normal trick, which bouncing their lasers back at them, doesn't work. Mm-hmm. And plus, it sounds like it sounds like they have each of those arm cannons belongs on a starfighter. To be honest, they like, do have some pretty heavy duty ordnance. Yeah, I, I, I haven't bothered to look at the tech specs because it's Star Wars. So you know, <laughs> for all it matters, I could just throw out a bunch of techno battle right now. Um, but you know what? The sound effect is what tells you what it's supposed to do, and they use the fucking starfighter cannon. <laughs> um, the sound effect for those guns um and the, the nice thing about it and the thing that that works for it is all the good guys react yeah all the protagonists react to them it's like oh fuck like you don't um, have the bad guys telling you how awesome they are you have the good guys telling you how scary they are by reacting accordingly yeah um so that that worked um anytime they rolled those things out that that worked for me because that like you said like we said it it created a sense of threat uh you understood that 
everyone was scared of these things. And then on top of that, that was played out in the action because everyone was scared of Vader. Everyone acted scared of Vader. But in the originals, you didn't see Vader do a whole hell of a lot. He ate dinner. Yeah, the very first time you see the droidicas, you see Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan just run for their lives because there's nothing else they can do. Yeah. Like, they're pinned down in an open corridor with two of these things advancing on them, just laying fire down. And they they talk about it, they come to a consensus, and they bolt. Because they there were. is no other option. <laughs> But I uh, and and you know they they make the good guys work, um, and that's a fun fight scene. Like that's a fun battle scene. Like I'm engaged with that. And you know what the you mentioned they they used a a heavier sounding effect for the droidicas. That is one thing that I've noticed they do pretty well throughout all of Star Wars. Um, I didn't pay as much attention to it in the originals because I I originally saw the originals a while ago before I was really obsessed with like voice acting and, and sound design and stuff like that. Um, but at least in the prequels and, and since then as well, they, they do their sound design very well. One thing I remember distinctly from episode two, I believe it is when they first introduced the B2 series droids. Um, you're used to the are, B1 having like the little blaster pistol that sounds kind of yippy. Like it's a Chihuahua gun. Are, are the B2s the, the, the more armored, uh, yeah, the 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 super like battle the droids. color, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ar- the arm gun ones. They have the the wrist mounted weapon. They right? have the arm gun, and that's the th- the first time you see one of them used. He's he's literally shoving aside one of the smaller B ones, just like smashes it to pieces to get it out of his way. Brings the arm up, and the sound that comes out of it is like they they took a B one's blaster pistol, cranked the speed up three or four times, and then base boosted it, and it's actually scary. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Um, and the you know what that is that is a thing. Sound sound design in Star Wars has always been spectacular. Uh, there's never a, a time when the sound is oh no, I take that back. Um, the Sarlacc pit when they had the Sarlacc pit burp after it ate Boba Fett. That was dumb. <laughs> I. I I, I want to go back and uh, I want to go back to the early eighties and smack the shit out of whoever everyone thought, whoever thought that was funny. You would um, have to smack the cocaine plate out of their hands first. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not play games here. We all know. <laughs> I was going to say, just, just, uh, just let Carrie Fisher know they were hoarding. Um, <laughs> she'd, she'd take care of that for me. <laughs> um, but apart from the Sarlacc burp and uh, their obsession with the Wilhelm scream, which, humorously enough, they restrain themselves in this week's episode of The Mandalorian. I, I will not speak on it because someone's going to mail a box of feces to my house if I do. But there is a point in this season, in this week's episode where they could have employed a Wilhelm scream, and they didn't. And I admired their restraint. <laughs> I, I honestly expected it. I saw what was about to happen, and I was like, I'm about to hear a Wilhelm scream, and I didn't. I thought, ah, <laughs> someone someone grew up over it, ILM. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, you know, but like... I just think about the TIE Fighters, like the engine sound effect. That's That's one of the most iconic sound effects in cinema. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. No. Um Star Wars basically defined how we think space battles sound, which is fucking hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> which is so 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 funny. Um That's why watching I, uh why watching Firefly is so jarring. Oh well, that that was that was done well though. That was that Oh was... sure, it was done very well. But you're so used to like the the Star Wars Star Trek version of what space battles sound like that when you see they show you an exterior of some kind of space combat as limited as it was in the series. And it's just dead silent. Like maybe a little bit of a, of plucky Western guitar in the background, but like no, no sound. Yeah. Yeah. Um, But yeah, it's, you know, going back to the idea, like, um, so your, your, what was your list again? Rogue one, Mando and uh, clone wars, clone wars. Um, 
and mine is uh episode four same thing except episode four instead of clone wars um it, it just it just works to have a sense of threat to have a sense of loss and or potential loss um that's to me at least that's one of the differences between bad star wars and good star wars um because star wars can very quickly feel like a superhero movie yeah like especially if you're dealing with jedi it's just like ah they'll be fine you know clark will figure out a way to clark will figure out a way through this you know it might look and it might look like it's trouble but this is batman who gives a shit my you know, friends given... and I actually just watched the death of Superman. There were several times to the movie like, ah, oh, Superman's going to save me. And then he doesn't. And uh, <laughs> I was like, oh, well, that guy died disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so, you know, and Mando does this well. Um, almost to the point that sometimes I'm, I'm starting to worry that they might, uh, they might wharf the Mandalorian. Like, not, like I, I don't think it's there. It's there, but there's always that risk of, you know, him becoming a character who can never do any, him never manage to do a single thing by himself. Yeah, th- there's something that, uh, th- there's a guy that I'm familiar with who, who reads and, and reviews comic books. And he says, if your name is on the title, then you should be the person doing the coolest thing in your own book. If I pick up Iron Man number seven, and the coolest person in Iron Man number seven is not Iron Man. There's something wrong with Iron Man number seven. So if Mando can never be the one doing the cool stuff, if Mando is always tripping through the galaxy, getting saved by other people, you're right. That, that kind of is the Worf effect where they established Worf as the, the martial badass. So every week they, they had something dangerous. They had to have it beat up Worf so that you would know it was dangerous. Yeah, um, I I don't. It's you know it's going to be a risk, um, and I kind of think it kind of always is a risk in that kind of you know lone lone wolf and lone wolf and cub type of series. Um, well, and it's a balancing act too because you also don't want to flip it the other way and turn him into Superman. Yeah, no, and I mean it's you know it's. Yeah, it's it's kind of the balancing act, but I think overall they've done a good job of presenting things that are legitimate threats, but letting Mando keep his credibility. Well, the other thing too is that despite the fact that he's basically proof against small arms fire, he doesn't always act like he's proof against small arms fire. So like he he doesn't take that for granted, and he behaves like getting shot would be bad, even though normally it, it's nothing more than like you know throws his shoulder back a little bit. Um, but he doesn't do stupid stuff like walk out into the hallway in front of a bunch of stormtroopers and just casually pick them off one at a time, even though theoretically he could do that. It would just look dumb. Well, I, I mean, I, I think it's, I think it's, a, I, I think that's actually an important part of the building, the idea that this character is, perceives themselves to be in danger because yes. yeah, his best, his best guard armor is awesome, but you know, we can see the places where there's no plate. <laughs> like there, there's so, a know. visor if if by by chance he took a blaster bolt to the visor he'd be having a really bad day yeah um you know that i'm pretty sure that coverall is not best car nope uh you know there's those, those are pajamas <laughs> yeah um <clears throat> so you know it it's good to see them acknowledge that and that this character who is trained to kill people would understand I cannot just rely on my best car. Uh, and it makes times when like uh, in episode three, when he, uh, when he draws, when he draws aggro to throw his thermal detonators, um, that makes it impressive mm-hmm. because you're like, Oh, well it must be serious that he's doing this thing that he normally doesn't do. Uh, and it was, it was, you know, the circumstances warranted it. <clears throat> um but yeah, th- overall, I think they do a pretty good job of, of making things threatening, but not making him a joke. Yeah. You know, it's always important, you know, yeah, they can, the character can accept help, but give them, give them their own adventure every once in a while. Uh, let them do things on their own. It kind of actually, uh, the Witcher kind of annoyed me with that. Cause like, 
I felt like for most of the like after the first third of the series, like it was pretty much the Witcher does some, you know, a Geralt gets in trouble and has to be bailed out by somebody else. And it's like, well, what the fuck is this guy? Like, what this, what's the good of this dude then? Like, what's his, what's the point of him? Um, I, I don't think I saw past the first third because when it came out, I was extremely sick and I watched a few episodes while being uh, in a recliner with a severe fever. And the fact that they were doing that time skip thing that they did way better in Westworld didn't jive well with my fever addled brain. So I never really went back. Oh, yeah. No. Oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> Oh, that sounds terrible. Yeah. Um, you, like you have to just kind of take it as it is. And then like halfway through this, halfway through the f- season, it, it's kind of like, oh, this is what's happening. And then you understand it. Banshee figured out that they were time jumping like halfway through the series. And then she went back and rewatched the whole series with that in mind because <laughs> she just wanted to have that present while, while yeah. she was, while she was watching it. Um, And again, the, the, it's, I like it because it's like a high, it's like watching a stick jock walk through a high production value LARP. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Geralt is just spends the series waiting for people to shut up and tell him what to stab. Did, didn't we determine that Geralt was basically us when we first started doing campaign LARPs? Yes. Like yes. some some big thuggish looking guy with more armor than he needs just walks up sits down pulls out something alcoholic and starts grunting at you until you point him at something that's colored funny (laughs) see that guy over there with the rubber mask (laughs) fuck (laughs) and and then we go go hurt feelings and make friends uh well, another, yeah, um, another thing that I really like about Mando is the the time setting. And I know that there was a lot of discussion when it first came out, like, oh, this is Baby Yoda. So this takes place 700 years. No, it it, it doesn't. It takes place short. I think. I think you, it's 7, A, 7 ABY. Yeah. So it's it's shortly after the Battle, Battle of Endor. The Empire is starting to kind of fracture from the strain of not having an Emperor. Um, and seeing that kind of... Uh, that balkanization of what was once the empire is really cool. Cause it's something that was addressed in the old Canon and just seeing what they do with it. Now they're, they're not. So, so like I've said, they're, they replaced a lot of the old EU with just different versions of the same stuff. Um, <laughs> just less well done. But in this case, <laughs> I, I like what they're doing with it. Um, it's, yeah. it's not wholly dissimilar from like the whole warlord thing that kind of happened after Endor in, in the old EU, but, uh, like Moff Gideon as basically a, a proto warlord, uh, makes a lot of sense. It fits the setting and I like it. I'm a big fan. Moff Gideon is the, uh, the guy who was the, uh, who owned the chicken restaurant in, yes. uh, yep. Bad. okay. Yes. <laughs> yep. That's what I thought. Um, <laughs> he's also the for, dentist in Payday 2. <laughs> um yeah no i like that um the the idea that even though the the empire is theoretically you know f- failing it's still dangerous and there's there's still bits of it that have more life in it than others yeah um it's it's it plays it plays with a it's a good space to play in uh transition periods are always a good space to set things in because everything's up in the air and you know if you look at historical transition periods that's when weird shit happens that's when unexpected shit happens um honestly that that's how downton abbey hooked me it it took place in that that weird period where that that social strata wasn't quite sure what to do themselves anymore because the way things were was going away um and just that the particularly the seasons that happened post world war 1 where you know the the earl of the manor is just questioning his position in the world uh there were there was a lot of good good plot to dig out of that i, I was i was enjoying it i i am way too much of a jacobin to watch downton abbey <laughs> i've been in the room when amanda watches it and 
and I just start humming Lama side la Lama side to myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I, I can't I can't enjoy that kind of re regency stuff, uh, Edwardian. Uh, I'm just like oh. Da -da 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 -da. <laughs> And sure, it's uh, it's on a different scale than the empire collapsing, but but it, no, it goes no. to the same thing as you said of of like a transition or a, a transitional period. So like in Star Wars, particularly in the Mando, we're seeing things like Werner Herzog and uh, <laughs> goodness, I forget Los Pollos Hermanos' name. I know it because I, I I've seen and heard him in a lot of other stuff. But yeah, Moff Gideon and uh, Werner Herzog, who I don't think we get a name for other than the client. Yeah, um, but like the these small bit players in the empire kind of becoming um powers of their own. Uh it's it's not quite a one-to-one -one analogy for the head butler having to make do with having maids serve dinner because that is simply not done. <laughs> but uh it's it's the same same type of issue. Yeah, um well it's 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 interesting because you know, you're going back to the Rogue One and Episode Five sort of feel. In those stories, when you attract the the attention of the Empire, bad things happen, and you cannot stop them. Like, you just can't. Um, well, and now that we're dealing with a much smaller subsection of the Empire, we also have a much smaller protagonist. We have yeah. one guy and a baby. But but uh, but the point I was going at is um you can tell stories that where the empire still has that intimidation effect. Like it still can throw more hardware and more bodies at problems than pretty much anyone else. But it's manageable, or not even manageable. It's you can you can resist it, you can fight it. And you can possibly win. You could pull out the against the odds win, but not in the traditional Star Wars way where you do something stupid and reckless that should not work, but it does because space magic. Um, you know, if you're cunning and smart and just better, you can pull off the, the win because, you know, they could, their trump card on, uh, their trump card in the end of season one of the Mando was a heavy stubber or not, it was a Weber, right? Uh, in the E-Web. In the E-Web, yeah. That was their trump card. Their trump card wasn't dropping an at-at. They didn't, have, they didn't even have a scout walker. Uh, yeah, no. I don't even know if they had, like, a light cruiser or anything. Um, Gideon had his TIE fighter, and the rest of it was just ground pounders. He had a bunch of, uh, a bunch of white jobs with an E-Web that was, you know, perfectly capable of turning that bar inside out. But uh, they didn't really have a lot of air support. They didn't have armor support. Still had a lot more firepower than one Mando, one X Rebel drop trooper, and uh, whatever. An IG, an IG series. <laughs> well, more importantly, a deprogrammed IG series that is no longer a proper IG series. It's now a nurse droid. That's true. Um, and whatever Carl Weathers is today. <laughs> But yeah, so it's they're still dropping it it's a smaller empire. But like I was saying, they're and, and like you were saying, they're still dropping more than you can, you know, casually deal with just because we're we're looking at it from from the point of view of, of a smaller set of protagonists. We don't have the Rebel Alliance, we have Mando and the kid. Yeah. Uh, or, and, and Go ahead. Well, and it changes the it actually changes the scale of the threat because so uh, apart from the actual assault on Scarif, most of the interaction with the Empire in Rogue One was was mar largely impersonal. Like they were too big to really notice individuals. You might get caught up in a sweep, or they might decide to you know to glass your planet. But uh, but. You know, they weren't going after the protagonists one to one. Um, they weren't looking for them personally. They were just kind of clearing the area. Um, 
even and, their own lost transport pilot, like they didn't put out an APB or anything. It was just like, well, that guy didn't show up for work. Cool. Get someone else. Yeah. And, you know, as, as a, as a military bur- bureaucracy ought to, um, but you know, and that is a, is a very real threat, but you can hide from it. You can blend into the crowd. Um, you know, if you don't draw attention to yourself, chances are it's not gonna it's not interested in ruining your day in particular like unless it has a good reason it's not really going to go out of its way to fuck you individually like they might decide to arrest everyone on your block and then good game uh but you know that's not that's impersonal um versus in the mando that's a whole lot of hardware and a whole lot of individuals coming after you in particular. And that kind of changes the stakes. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that's, you know, that, that smaller scale in some ways is a, is a, is a more effective personal threat. Um, I just think that works. Um, and it's easier for, for an audience member to grasp too. I mean, you you can get to a point of scale where it's just nonsensical and there's no way your average viewer is going to wrap their head around it and it's just look at the pretty lights. Yeah, or the destruction of Alderaan. You know, it has no emotional weight. Right, because we don't really know any Alderaanians. At that point, yeah. we I don't even think we know that Leia's an Alderaanian and that's it. We've never we never met any others. There, there's no no one else lives there. It's just just her, and presumably she has parents. That's that's all we know. The first time we see Alderaan destroyed, yeah. Um, and it's 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 almost embarrassing the lightness with which Episode Seven handles the destruction of multiple systems. Like it just, and they try to make it mean something, but it doesn't. It's, like look. It's, Look at this brave young fleet officer looking at, at her own impending destruction. I, I don't care. I don't know who that is. I do not care. You can't make me care, movie. Don't don't you try and make me care. <laughs> you haven't put yeah, it anywhere near um, enough effort. You know, versus um, when uh, the first time they fire up the super laser. Um, I can't remember what the Jedi what planet that Jedi's on. Uh, Jedi. Jetta, you know, versus you've just spent 30 minutes of the movie showing live in Jetta City and who are, you know, existing here and minding their own business. That's that's a different different kind of threat. Um, but yeah, you know, going back to the, 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 the fractured empire in a lot of ways m- makes better antagonist because you know, it it could be focused on you without you being a, a Luke Skywalker who is, you know, part of the cosmic order of the entire universe and, you know, magic space. Like, like you know, it could take notice of a more typical person. And I, I think that's, I think you're right. It's more understandable. It's more, you can grasp it better. So let's talk about um, the use of technology or the or the not use of technology, because I think that's something that we we both kind of enjoy about things like the Mando and uh, and you know Episode Four and uh, Rogue One. Episode Four, I will say, is a standout in this category because your first introduction to the universe. And the military hardware looks used, and it's great. Um, like when you see the hangar, it the the ships that you see in the hangar on Yavin Four uh, all look like they've been through the ringer. Like the these are these these starfighters were ridden hard and put away wet, and you can tell. Um, yeah, they they did a very very good job of making it look lived in and. When when episode one first came out, I really kind of hated the Naboo N one because it was bright yellow, and I don't like yellow to begin with. But and it just didn't look like military hardware. But like looking back on it, 
sure they they were fancy and all, but like they still had the the carbon scoring around the the torpedo tubes and all that. Like they still showed some signs of of use, despite being basically parade vehicles. Um, and you saw the same thing on the the Trade Federation droid tanks. They had that carbon scoring around the the rocket pods at the the base of the lift pad. Um. A lot of the rest of it was really pristine, and like I'm not gonna say episode one did this well, um, but it wasn't entirely abandoned like I like I thought when I first saw it when I was a kid. Uh, obviously, episode I think episode two was very similar to one, and that a lot of things looked a little too pristine for my liking. But uh, episode three, they they had put a lot more character into the clones, which I think was a big factor in it because the droids are always gonna look kind of pristine ish, I guess. I mean they're churned out of a factory daily. Um, It's not like they're usually in service long enough to acquire personal idiosyncrasies or anything of that nature. But I mean, the, the clones having individual unit colors and, and uh, patterns and stuff that they used that, that was, that was cool. And the hardware in episode three was starting to look more like, well, a like stuff we were used to, so you saw like precursors to things we were familiar with, but also it it looked a bit more, a bit more like hardware than the stuff you saw in episode one. Yeah, um, I mean the episode. Uh, you cut out again. That you're having some kind of issue with your mic, or every once in a while you say something and it just cuts you off. Uh, let me check my sensitivity real quick. But yeah, um, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> yeah, let, let me. Oh, that was a little high. Okay, that should be better. All right, cool. Um, yeah, I, I'm. I mean, episodes one and two, they just went. They just went ham with CGI and ability of animating every goddamn thing that they could conceivably think of um and i think the look suffered for it yes i did i haven't watched them in so long you might be i'm, I'm sure you're right about the carbon scoring and the usage things but fundamentally um i just think it was going to be a it probably was always going to be a product of its time um i don't think cgi was developed enough for them to do what they needed to do with it and they probably that was never ever going to happen. Um, you know, ILM has an ethos of pushing the envelope, so they were going to push the envelope. Um, but I'm like <laughs> one of my favorite things is about episode four is that every little piece of technology feels precious. Like, yes. you know, you were talking about how the hangar looked so good, so much like an actual military facility um, and one that was used by a bunch of friggin' yeah, barely have enough, you know, bailing wire to get the X swing back, to, you know, to fix the S foils when they won't go into attack position. <laughs> um, you know, it just did such a good job. But even before that, like your first real intro to well you know the chase scene with the star destroyer um your first intro to how the rest of the universe lives is the fucking sand crawler yep. and the jawas rolling yard sale <laughs> where like, where half the droids break <laughs> while spectacularly while, while luke and uncle owen are are are, are window shopping like the, the 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 merchandise is exploding <laughs> Um, and that's just such good scene setting and characterization. And you're like, okay, yes, they have androids, sort of, sort of when they work, <laughs> when they work, yeah. Um, sand and electronics and, you know, still don't get along well. Say again, is it sand and electronics still don't get along well in in the uh, <laughs> in the high tech? universe <laughs> honest to god one of my favorite moments of uh 
of episode one because it was it was one of the most true to human behaviors that you'll ever see in, in anything and it's the fact that um the tuscan readers um just sit outside the this the uh the pod, pod race <laughs> and just take pot shots at everybody because it's the most <laughs> like absolutely absolutely if i was if i was an angry displaced sand person from uh from tatooine and i had it and i had a chance to do this yeah fuck them <laughs> so, so, so you mean they're coming by so fast there's no way on earth they're going to be able to turn around and do anything about it sure <laughs> I'll take I'll take some shots. <laughs> this is going to be the highlight of my season. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, just like the fact that there's the tech there there is this technology in this universe, but it is it is not a fix all. It is not it is not something that could be relied on. It is a tool that works sometimes and works not at other times. Uh, I, I just like that. And I think, you know, when you're, when you're episode two and episode three and you're set in the, in the core worlds and, or you're set, you know, in clone wars and you're set as part of this lavishly funded military operation, like <laughs> how many different vehicles do they pull on in clone wars for every single. There's, there's a lot, there's a lot of vehicles whose only appearance is in clone wars. <laughs> yeah um like like i would pref- it, to me it's more interesting to see them struggle with shit that's not you know for them to not to land on the water world and have something that's not a custom jet ski <laughs> you know stuff like that um and where they have to cope and make do um because there's a lot of making do in rogue one and episode four in mando like one of my favorite things about Mando is the fact that he runs out of ammo. Yeah. And he can't get it. He can't get those little wrist dart things. They they are a, a extremely limited supply. Um and I just think it's it, it just puts it back on the characters to find solutions to their problems instead of calling on the in universe equivalent of magic which it sometimes feels like technology is in some Star Wars movies. Uh, sidebar, this is actually the thing that I liked most about both Enterprise and Voyager, was that that scarcity. Voyager was fun when shit stopped working. Yes. I need to go back, and I actually need to go back and rewatch Voyager. I, I, think, I, I, think, I, I think I did Janeway dirty when I was younger. The writing wasn't the best, and Janeway, specifically as a character, was a bit inconsistent, depending on who the writer was for the week. Um, but overall, it has that same atmosphere. Um, that having to make do, that that scarcity that you don't really get in TNG, because the Enterprise is the flagship of this massive, you know, quadrant-spanning military scientific organization. But Star Wars... Because <laughs> if we get the Trekkies in here, this is it's going to go downhill. Yeah, um, like you know, and it kind of goes back to the Serenity slash fi- Firefly connection, where half the time the technology isn't a solution to your problem; the technology is your problem because you need to get the thing to work. Um, you know when your ship stops working this becomes a very big problem for everybody um so we need to put a lot of our effort into making sure this ship stays functional um that mon calmari needs to buy new sweaters (laughs) he has last year's version (laughs) um i love i love the monk the sweater mon cal the sweater mon cal is now my favorite mon cal (laughs) Sweater Mon Cal is an entire mood, and I'll bet that man has a, his own cranberry bog. Oh, absolutely. I mean, he's got the waiters. Yep. No, that's what those waiters are for. People think he was some sort of like shell fisherman. No, no, no. That man was a space cranberry farmer. <laughs> Squid and cranberries must be fall. <laughs> 
Um, but yeah, like that's always an interesting plot point to me. Like when the technology that you rely on is your enemy half the time because you need to keep it in, you know, you need to keep gathering the MacGuffins to keep it working. Um, I don't know. I just, that really works for me. Um, I would actually, be, so, so you describe the technology as basically working like magic some of the time. I would say that the same rule kind of applies to the force. And I think that's the issue that some people had with the force in the sequel trilogy, where it just became bigger and flashier and more powerful. Um, and I mean, you, you can debate the various merits of whether or not Ray actually trained at all. That That's irrelevant. It's it's the portrayal of the power. For the purpose of, the, of this discussion, we're talking about like how the power is used, what it's used for. And it just becomes so big and such a band-aid and such a cure-all in, in the sequels. Um, and I think that th this is a good point to tie back to to our usual focus of of um, LARPing and, and other forms of gaming is that if if your special powers solve everything, it, you get bored. Yeah, um, yeah, it's yeah. No, you're right. It's it's boring. Um, D and D wizards are boring. Not gonna lie. Um, you know, after a certain point, you could do anything you need to do with magic, and it just starts to curtail your creativity because you know, it's like OG Star Trek where you could just say the right words and fix your problem. Um, but so, how would how would you capture that kind of hard scrabble? Um, shit constantly breaking aspect um how would that translate to a larp so the way a lot of places do it that i hate and i want to cover this is limited uses per time period and i don't think that's the answer i i'm not sure i have a solid concept of, of how i would best portray it but i know that's not the way well depending on the ability though um, cause a lot of times that like, sure, uh, limiting things per, per period or, or per session or limiting things to points is, is a useful mechanic, but like when it's basic stuff, I, I hate it. Um, so I guess it depends on the ability. If it's like a, a get out of jail free card level thing. Yeah. Limiting it to like once or twice an event, but I, I don't even know if, if I like the idea of something that all encompassing existing i don't know there's a lot of context that goes into how i would how i would need to answer the question i think all um, right so what what context maybe we can maybe we can do it for instance so um let, let's do it for instance for each of our for for our two favorite examples we'll do it for instance for for damn wrong and we'll do it in a for instance for dead legends because the the you can only slit throats three times per six hour period is, is not a factor in either of those games. And that's the thing that I, I just, I, I cannot abide. Um, so for Dead Legends, trying to give it uh, that, that hard scrabble atmosphere, I think it already does reasonably well. Um, but then again, I'm also, I've, I've only played like two games, so my character doesn't have a lot of resources. I don't know what it's like at, at different tiers of play if it becomes less hard scrabble over time. Um well, well the the immediate thing I would do to make it more hard scrabble um I would I would limit the amount of the amount of shots that a player can carry. Okay, no that that would that would be a good first step. Um because I get, I think a big part of making any game feel hard scrabble is, is going to be to introduce elements of resource management. Yeah. Where um you you know you become under pressure uh because you're expending resources. And uh I think limiting the physical shots that a player can fire in a game like Dead Legends. Um well I in fact I know it's a it's a huge issue because um in the Halloween, in the Halloween scenario from last year, uh, they did that uh, because you're not allowed to glean ammunition while you're while the mods still while you're still in combat. Um, so they just made us 
just use up all our ammo. And they just kept throwing zombie respawns at us. Well, until we were just out of ammo. I, I think what you told me at the time was that people aren't used to having to manage their ammo, so they were spending bullets like water, and all of a sudden there were there was a a lot more sponge than they were prepared to deal with. Um, it was partly that, and uh, just the resource management on the PCs side was awful. Um, uh, that's what I mean. The PCs weren't used to having to manage their resources. Yeah, but not even just bullets. Um, the healing resources were utterly mismanaged and completely wasted uh just squandered the healing uh, resources um i i think are in a pretty good place as far as hard scrabble goes um that is to say i've never had the luxury of walking around with three or four potions of healing in my pocket like maybe you would at, at other games uh when i get hurt i tend to have to go to the hospital which might sound boring but that can spawn some little conflicts and adventures of its own and it can become a logistical thing like if i'm fighting off in the woods somewhere i'm like oh man i should probably go to the hospital for this bullet wound or something now i gotta get there and that you know there's that little journey and complications can arise there so that that's all all well and good um Um, yeah i mean it, it it does okay with it um and it depends on like basically if you if you're running the if they're running the game in hard mode it becomes very hard scrabble um and you expend resources really fast um and i guess it, for me it would be a big question of would that be maintainable long term and i don't think in as the game is currently written and with the resources the players currently have no because you basically have to run things in turbo mode and that is not long term sustainable but if you were to cut the player access to resources, yes, you could you could get that sense of feeling. So I mean that's part of it, limiting resources. Um and just, you know doing things like adding a mechanical cost, a rules cost to represent things that will be very difficult to do in the real world. Uh, you know, if you're carrying actual bullets. Bullets are heavy. Brass is heavy. Lead is heavy. You know, um, maybe you're carrying 50 to 100 bullets if you're carrying a lot of ammo. I don't know. I actually don't know what an appropriate loadout would be for someone with a stick shooter. I'm I'm not as familiar with uh, that era as far as like what would be a reasonable number to carry, like how many go in a cartridge belt or, or whatnot. But yeah, like if you're using something that fires rival balls, you could theoretically have a couple hundred rival balls in like a messenger bag and it would weigh what? Three pounds? I ha- I, car- I carry 200 mega darts. Yeah. I carry them in a message bag. They don't weigh anything. So you could carry like 600 rival balls. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and not, even, not even worry about it. And when you have 600 rival balls, if you're in a shootout with bandits, you're just gonna stay right where you are and keep shooting it out because bandits carry like 12 shots <laughs> speaking from personal experience we are we are operating on a very limited loadout uh we should just we should just be dicks and just buy uh like ten dollar satchels for the bandits it just give all just give all the bandits them. an ammo belt donate them get some service points um, but yeah, and two, if if there were a limit on that, say you can only have, say like forty eight rounds, if you if you carry a six shooter, yeah. Well, well, now you're not just gonna hammer them off as fast as you can, and if you uh, if you start to run low, you're gonna have to think about, you know, may, maybe you should have brought a slightly longer knife, my my guy. And just just um, and the idea that when they're gone, they're gone. Yeah, um, like I don't know how you would do. I mean, unless you just make it a crafting thing, and people have to make bullets uh, and gather the resources to make bullets, um, which might be a thing. I don't know. Um, but just the idea that you can't just finish up a fight and then go pick up the rival balls and I then th- be I back think, up the fall. I think crafting is a thing for special rounds, not necessarily for common rounds. Oh, it, yes. As the rules stand now, it's for special rounds. Yeah. But, but, but making saying, it something for common rounds as well, you're saying, would, would be another way to, to to help introduce that. Like, hey, you can't just carry 600 rival balls. 
Well, because the thing is, if even if you you limit them to, you know, let's say you limit them to six reloads, you can carry whatever your max capacity of the gun is times six. Which is reasonable. Which, yeah. Um, if you can pick up ammo, that isn't a long-term issue. Right. It's only an issue in in the span of one module. Yeah. Um, you know, so even if you, you know, in, in Dead Legends, you always have ammo attrition because you just can't find everything. So, you know, even if you're losing 5% of your shots, you know, you could still string that 48 shots along for a very, for a very long time without feeling, uh, without feeling any pressure versus if that's the number of shots you have until the next refresh. So from, you know, from noon to six o'clock, you have 48 shots. Or until the next time, or until the next time you can get to a general store or a blacksmith. Yeah. Um, that's a different kettle of fish. Yeah. Like if these 48 rounds are the only 48 rounds I have until the next time I see a guy who's got a reloading press, Ooh, I'm going to be a lot more careful about where I send those 48 rounds. Mm -hmm. Um, the healing is probably right about where it needs to be. Yeah. Nothing about the healing has stood out to me as egregious. Uh, actually, no, I think the healing is, I, I, like their system of healing the best out of any I've experienced. Um, and that's, that's by a large part due to the, the healers, the docs and dead legends are to a person really good at their RP. Yeah. They, they play the, uh, the medicing very well. Yeah. Um, and they, they, it's really neat to see everyone with their unique style. Um, and they all treat it as serious. None of them, none of them, None of them half-ass it. Like it's so they always treat it as if it's a, as if it's a serious thing, uh, and that is something that is a really cool thing to see, because uh, there is no mechanical reason for them to do that. They could absolutely half-ass it, but the they choose not. to. The first time I went to the hospital, I was healed by a German doctor, um, and it was it was my first game, and I had like zero dollars because my background does not include money. <laughs> uh, Strangely enough, despite being a, a Prussian nobleman, I, I didn't cross the ocean with a bucket of cash. So, uh, yeah, I didn't have much money. And the the person running the hospital was super angry at the German doctor who fixed me up because him and I conversed in German. And he said, oh, don't worry about it. So I did. I just on my own initiative, I pulled a couple of shifts guarding the hospital because I, I felt like that was a nice thing to do. But the the person running the hospital was super mad at him that he didn't like charge me exorbitantly to help them buy more supplies. <laughs> <sighs> well, I mean that's the other that's the other interesting thing. Um, healing costs money in that game. Yeah, like they they burn through supplies, um, which is a nice mechanic. Um, I actually appreciate that their gear degradation is pretty low. Like now that I've got the upgraded rifle, I will have it for, I think an in-game year before I need to fix it. Like, like I have it for 12 games before something needs to happen. I need to put more resources into that. I think that's, that's reasonable. Now, is it 12 games or 12 games that you're there for? 12 games. Yeah. That's what I thought. If it was 12 games that I was there for. It'd be last for fucking ever. Right. That'd be no, that'd be no meaningful impediment. Um, no, it's, it's, it's calendar and I'm sure there's going to be a thing because fucking COVID. Um, yeah, all my stuff broke a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> Even the nice sword is busted. <laughs> did we? Oh yeah, we did get you a nice sword. We did make me a nice sword. Yep. I think we had enough material to make me one nice weapon and we made it the sword. Yep. Well, I think my dagger was already nice because I, I could have like one fine short weapon or something as part of my starting package. But yeah, so I so I mean, with with a with a few tweaks, I think Dead Legends will be in a good in a good spot to experiment with that sense of like must conserve. Um, now, not that we're saying that this is the ideal place for a LARP to be in or that this is like inherently the best way to play it, but we like it. Yeah. And, this would be really cool for us to see. So, so honestly, I could almost see a, 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 
a Star Wars version of Dead. Like you could just reskin Dead Legends as the Star Wars. And um, stop. And I think that actually... We run enough games already. Oh, please, God, <laughs> no! I... This is not. I don't. I do not want to. Um, but someone could. For... Can you talk for a second? I'll be back. Yeah, we're we're not saying that we would do that because we won't and we can't and we don't want to. But someone certainly could. Um, now, as for Damarung, uh, there's not really a lot of resources in Damarung. So, I mean, it kind of already has... It's hard to quantify that level of scarcity. Damarung is hard scrabble by nature. It's it's part of the background of, of the game world itself. We're, we're in a, a hard scrabble time. It's a hard scrabble setting. Um, but it's not like... I am back. Okay, cool. I was just describing that Damarung has the hard scrabble kind of baked into the to the lore, but um, from our side of things, at least as the Jotnar, we don't really see a lot of like material hard scrabble because we're no. not super concerned about it. We have we have our blue rocks, and that's really the only resource that we have any concern for. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's true. Um, just just. Um... To circle back so let's circle back to what I was saying about uh, reskinning Dead Legends as Star Wars, just to kind of capture that hard Scrabble feeling. Um, just because I want to explore that a little bit, like like I think in a in a tech driven setting, you can really play with that uh, because you know every not every game but you know you could throw in the this important piece of life preserving equipment has broken how do you fix it you know what do you need to do to fix it um and just play with you know play with that and that as a mechanic i don't know but yeah let's talk about damaron let's talk about damaron i i do like the idea of dead legends reskin to star wars um hopefully somebody runs with something like that because uh Cool, but Damrung, um, it's a hard Scrabble setting, but we don't really encounter it too much as Jotnar because there aren't really any resources we care about. Well, I think it's a it's it's unfortunately it stays as an RP thing. Yeah, because it's a game that again it doesn't enforce consequences. So you could RP that your character is starving, or you could but... RP that you're reduced to monosyllabic grunts because you went through the yote gate too many times but you know there is no mechanical pressure from the game itself um now i thought um because they have their war game system so damarong has a has an attached war map with uh, different colored territories that um, the human factions can squabble over uh, and the human, you know, there are quests and things that human factions can do during a game that can influence the war game. Um, I always thought it would be an interesting mechanic that um, you needed a certain number of resources to maintain what you have in the war game. And then you just don't put enough resources into the world for everyone to do it. Yeah, that <laughs> that would start some conflict. Yep. Um, yeah, uh, and it's just natural organic conflict. Um, you know, each t <laughs> each of three teams the... needs ten food. There is twenty five food in the world. Yeah, I was Go. gonna say it, it, it's starting to rain, and there's three monkeys waiting to get on the boat. <laughs> <laughs> only room for two buddies <laughs> um but yeah i think you would need something like that um and it's like the problem is it's hard to do without snowballing it's hard to do without snowballing and the other thing is that from the perspective of someone who has never seen this mythical map that whole system is kind of opaque to as far as I can tell, most people. Yeah, that, well, that's the other thing. The on, only the people who care, the only the people who care about the map, care about the map. The and map no, does not no one else has even else. seen it. 
yeah well we we don't see it because we're not allowed to go in the human castles and it's in the human castle well we're I thought in the last game we were supposed to send like a tactical envoy who was supposed to deliver your directives as far as troop movements or something like that. Did that ever even really happen? No one wanted to get out of their makeup. Oh, <laughs> so that was what it required. <laughs> yeah. Um, Goodness. Yeah. You know what? Putting on full face makeup is expensive. Yeah. And, and I don't like doing it, so I don't want to do it more than I have to. Yeah, yeah, I will put well, it on once. I will play the game, and when I am done, I'm not putting it back on. I'm, I'm yeah, done. Certainly not in the same day. Certainly not in the same day. Um, but yeah, I think, I think Damrong's setting would be makes sense for this kind of world. I don't think Damrong's game is structured uh, in a way that is going to make it work, just because of the snowballing effect. Because Damrong is PvP. Uh, you need a PVE game yeah. because, you know, if you're, you know, if there's a meta game where your acquisition of resources in the game world affects the meta and then the meta affects the game, you will invariably get one faction who is just racking up the points and just absolutely snowballs and crushes everybody. The the Nordvik are just going to start a gank train and just roll around 30 deep. Yeah. Um go home with all the marbles so i don't i don't think it works in a, in a pvp game at least not in a long-term pvp game you could probably make something work over a weekend and that's more milsim paintball style yeah um you know which is which is doable you know what rather than we'll talk about this with damron let's talk about how you do this in hearth light Ooh, yes. In the in the theoretical, and here's the thing: um, Tycho and I have always dreamed of the Hearthlight were equivalent of a Milsim paintball game or a Milsim airsoft game, and uh, kind of what turns we tried out, to do with Leeds. Yeah, and, and Leeds Leeds was marginally successful, and I think uh, the revised Victory was more successful, uh, but ultimately the problem is medieval shit is more exhausting than pew pew shit yeah like I've, I've, I, you and i have both done both and yes yeah like and i mean for me like it's it's a little different because i'm just used to i'm just used to it so me spending 12 hours in armor running through the woods is like normal so like yeah it's more tiring than paintball shit but i don't it's not a hindrance to me, but for the majority of people, we were, were as we learned about at Leeds, about five to six hours is everyone's is everyone's tap out point. And after so, that, you, you just have, you know, the uh... salt, salt and rhino hiding. <laughs> well, you you either have salt and, and rhino hiding, or or you have the, the, those of us who paced ourselves a bit better and and we're just sneakier and more more efficient with where we devote our energy but there's like the four of us <laughs> it, it doesn't really amount to a whole lot yeah but um but in a fantasy world in a fantasy world where where you know player exhaustion was less of a thing um how would that look in a battle game so we're thinking like a weekend scenario i think yeah yeah, uh, yeah, or at least a full day. I think let's, the let's assume we have a weekend to play with, if that makes sense. Sure, sure. I think the easiest way to do it is what you touched on earlier: is each team needs X resources. There are, you know, X minus Y resources in the world. But how do you work that? How do you work that mechanically? Uh, well, they they would have to be physical resources, and I don't mean like ribbons tied to trees. That that works well enough for a game where you're you're like acting it out um but i'm thinking like water barrels like like the water buffaloes at uh at emr yeah like so something that's going to take actual logistics to move like you're, you're going to need to to set a detail to to handle this thing um it, it should be an expenditure to actually get it back um 
and you should have to consider like is is it worth us devoting the manpower it's going to take to move this thing um and what are we giving up elsewhere to do it like having to make those kinds of decisions can can be really really intense and and really cool i think that's you know that that that's our personal taste um, i i would agree i would agree um so I actually think it would need to be a combination of, of the physical objectives that are irritating to move. So, you know, uh, the water buffaloes we're talking about are basically eight foot plastic cubes. Um, they're reasonably light, but they are, they are big and they are not easy to move by yourself um, to give you a con a context to what we're talking about. Honestly, I would prefer, I would prefer sledges like, big heavy things you have to drag like basically wooden sledges loaded up with rocks to be honest with you or cinder blocks or something that would also be pretty cool just really make it a pain in the ass um like this should not be a casual thing you can't just grab garcia and say garcia bring me back three of the objective do you remember uh it was one of the early events we ran and uh it was a it was a capture the flag thing and we used my I know armor exactly bag. the one you're talking about yeah <laughs> <laughs> and some little smart ass uh did a mad dash across the field and tried to snag it and just absolutely prat fault <laughs> yeah i i think <laughs> you nearly dislocated that that boy's shoulder cuz he grabbed the armor bag and you tried to keep running but the armor bag didn't move and he just flipped over backwards i i didn't do a single goddamn thing that's true. You did not actively participate. He nearly not. he nearly took his own shoulder out of joint by trying to grab that thing and go. Yeah, I did not do a single thing. You do not put that on me. You you merely placed the temptation in his way and and he seized upon it. <laughs> but yes, um, it, it should be something like that and not something that you can just send a Garcia to go and just grab a bunch. Go Hey, go play Sonic for a bit and bring me back some rings. Um, so, so honestly, and this is where it always falls down because tracking points in a, in an actual system in an actual physical real world system is very difficult. Um, and it's a, it's a mechanic that video games can use that just does not translate to a real world. You're talking about Um, like how, how long they're held by each team and, and stuff like that. Just, just, just keeping track of score in general. Yeah. Um, there's no real good way to, to do real time updates. Um, I'm not, unless you have an extensive crew with walkie talkies, um, which is just manpower that we usually don't have. Um, cause honestly, I, I would like, so I, I, the way I'm seeing this would be, you have the resources, um, and there are a, a limited number of resources, but you also have points that you have to, that you can you know, that, um, that are worth holding for whatever reason. Um, and the reason I want to have both is because if there's just the resources, people can hoard them and set up a perimeter and just turtle. And that creates a slow, unfun game. Yeah. I think the combination you're right, that will help to break that up because if one team tries to turtle, well, the other team or teams will be able to take all the capture points. Yeah. Um it it would and, be very difficult to maintain a cordon on your base that can deny all comers and also send out enough people to to man the post. Yeah, and that will be part part of it. Like the thing the, the MacGuffin should be a pain in the butt, but they shouldn't be impossible to move. It should just be a commitment to move them. Right. So like you know, three to four people should be able to make off with one you know, abscond with it if there's a distracting attack. Um, it should not be. You have to, you know, lock down the territory and then, you know, haul it out like you're building a pyramid. Bring in a bunch of log rollers, set up a block yeah. and tackle. Yeah. Um, oh, no, we got to stop. Simpkin's leg got crushed. <laughs> it's just got to be something that's irritating, not something that's near impossible. Um. But yeah, ideally, um, 
the so if i in in the dream world because we've already acknowledged this is fantasy right this this, um, this could never actually happen yeah um and it's it's frustrating because it's so close <laughs> like all it would take is for lunch not to last so damn long like the like the 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 getting this to work it's there's just like two or three things that would need to fall into place but don't, they're not going to fall into place you're not going to get you know 300 olympic athletes to <laughs> to go run around in the woods and swing well, foam, foam sticks at each other. One of those few things that we would need to fall into place is like a 30% uptick in the overall cardiac health of the entire Eastern seaboard. <laughs> and I just don't see that happening in my lifetime. I was going to say short of us moving to Iceland, <laughs> <laughs> like maybe you could do this with like one of the Baltic States, you know, where suddenly we're the shortest ones around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, just me, Ray, and three hundred Techno Vikings. <laughs> um, but yeah. Um, so ideally, um, I would like it if everyone spawned with single sword, single blue, and the resources control of the resources gets you access to other gear. Stop! That's too good. Now I want it to work, but it won't. <laughs> I know, right? Because <laughs> no one has the attention span for this shit. I know, uh, and this has been in my head for years doing this, uh, and I've never figured out how to get it to work because I think it's I, I don't think it's workable fundamentally. Um, I just don't think the logistics are there, and yeah, it's just really it's really a logistics issue. Like, or like maybe you see a a grove of of small straight trees and now all of a sudden you can start fielding spears because you, you've you've taken the ash pollard <laughs> goodness that I would mean, be it, awesome <laughs> it, it could be it could be that you know and you could de theme it that way you know you could just have a you could just have a menu um but like all the ways to you know where the faction decides what it's going to spend its money on or resources on um, but I think that would be, that would really add some interesting dynamics to the game, um, and create that, that hard scrabble feeling, especially if there were things that you could spend the resources on that were not just straight weapons upgrades. Like, are we basically actually, describing Counter-Strike? I feel like we're basically describing Counter-Strike. Um, more like, uh... <laughs> Single sword remember round the, is the pistol round. Remember, um, remember when League did the uh, did the pirate themed special event? Yeah, that's what we're describing. Okay. Uh, where, you know, you're spending the points to upgrade the mobs that spawn or change the terms of their spawning. Um, it's just using actual people instead of mobs. I mean, it's a similar mechanic, though. They're also somewhat mob like on occasion. <laughs> but uh but yeah, I think that would be I think that would that would be really if you could somehow figure out how to work, how to make it work. I don't know how you figure out how to make it work. Yeah, like, no, I, I like the logistics are just so complicated and have so many moving parts that just experientially it won't work. Um, well, one thing's for sure, you, you can never do it without comms, so you would have to have comms. Um, you would have to have a player base that wants to play for, I would say, at least eight hours. I don't know about that. I think you could do this in four to six. I think you actually don't need the eight hours. I think we're stuck up, we're stuck on that because. Because we want the long, drawn-out... Yeah, okay. No, yeah. I can see it working in, in a four to six bit. And actually, if... if Because um, I remember we, we had talked about doing something like this. Or I forget if it was Victory or Siege, but like having small stuff happening Friday night that would give you things to use the next day. We talked about that for Victory. Yeah. Yeah, because I remember uh, we were going to have me run like a stealth mission that people could try to do that would give their team benefits on, on the next day. We never actually did it. 
Yeah. Um, but yeah, the idea that like you could come in Friday night, we're we're doing like the side quest stuff, and then Saturday is is the the campaign where you use what you've earned and try to get more stuff so you can actually field a decent army, not a bunch of clubs. Yeah, I I just would this work better with shooty sports? It probably would. I haven't done shooty sports in a while. Um because I'm just like imagining like the nice thing about shooty sports is like it's easier to limit people like you know um you know your side has to unlock this this ammo dump for you to use the x capacity magazines i don't fucking know um like i just feel like i feel like because you know, they're dependent on ammunition. Um, it's easier to it's easier to play games with how well weapons work. Sure, but a lot of that's in the in the underlying rules for an event to begin with. Like if we're talking about a Milsim game, my understanding is that in a Milsim game you're already limited to using magazines that only carry as many rounds as the real gun would have. Yeah, but so we if, don't need to we wouldn't need to do Milsim. We're just playing a fucking game. So you could be like everyone has to start off with like milsim mags but if you unlock this you can use high caps or something like that yeah shit like that that'd be pretty goofy <laughs> I, I could see that being entertaining um you know uh i don't i don't know um i don't know it's it's it just sucks that it's so hard to play with this kind of with this kind of hard scrabble concept in the real world without actually making your players sleep under a tree like I did at my first event. Yeah. <laughs> um, that, that was a, a hard scrabble event because I did not have a tent, so I slept in my cloak under a tree at that... Uh, at was back, this Baden? It was either Gates or Baden. It was one of those two because it was that we started, site. We started the same year, right? We might have. Um, did you start a year ahead of me? I think I may have started a year ahead. Uh, I think this is 2008 I'm talking about. No, if it was two thousand eight, I was start. I started. I think I started playing in two thousand seven or two thousand eight. Yeah, this was the year that I think Mog showed up in a limo that. Rog, oh, yep, yep, yep. And this is, yep, that was my first Baden too. Okay, so we did start the same year. Yep. <laughs> I think I, was thinking, I think that's the event I introduced you to Couscous. Ah, uh, do you know what? Yes, yes, it was because I did not have any food either, and I think. Frothgar gave me some Triscuits and you gave me some couscous and a bit of steak. And that was like <laughs> everything that I ate on Saturday. And then I slept under a tree again. <laughs> that was a weekend that I would not try to replicate in my current state of health. Because <laughs> I am not, what, 12 years ago? Yeah, I'm not that young anymore. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. You must have, were you like 18? I was 21. Oh, shit. <laughs> wow those were the days <laughs> i mean shit i was um, 26 something like that fuck it was way um, colder at night than i thought it was gonna be let me tell you what uh, but without making people do that kind of dumb shit um yeah no it's it's tricky because there's just so much behind the scenes stuff that you have to do to replicate, you know, all the programming that went into making Valorant. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it really, it really is. Um, and just, just can you, that's the hardest thing, controlling access to gear. Right. Like even if you have the players who fully buy into it, like, okay, you've gotten your upgraded gear. You died. Like you basically have to have a list back at each base of what they can spawn with because if someone dies and they go back and their team has lost control of the Ash Pollard, well, they can't go back out with their spear because they don't have access to spears anymore. Yeah. I mean, it might be. It might be doable if you're keeping... The only way it's doable is if you're keeping... If you limit the respawns to just... To just the central respawn where you can have that list. And you can keep track of, 
okay, team A has unlocked shields. Um, you know, so, okay, so team A can spawn with shields. Um, yeah, if you have a central respawn, it might be workable. I think people will get frustrated, though. Yeah, because imagine you have been waiting all day to get your spear. You get your spear, you go out, you take an arrow, you come back, and your team's lost the spear yard. Yeah, um, I don't even mean from that. I just mean from, you know, players don't react well to complicated rules. We've learned this. Yeah. Uh, so just the idea that they have to constantly switch and pay attention to what weapon they're using would drive most players batshit. What what was the gray male catchphrase that one year that made us all want to drag him down off that hay bale and stuff him inside it? Uh, or it inside all, him. all will be revealed. All will be revealed. All will be we'll reveal it then already. <laughs> yeah. Um I just think it's it might be too complex for a PvP medieval game. It might just be too much. <laughs> yeah, I I think the reality of it is that the computer games run so much of it in the background that we would have to run in the foreground that the the and logistics the, of the game would would override the actual game yeah it, it just and just not being able to do it instantaneously like not being able to have everything automatically update um like unless you did it halo style and had like loner weapons scattered throughout the woods that people could find and use as pickups and then if they die, they drop the pickup. I don't think that would work at all. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't think that would work at all um, for a bunch of reasons. Um, but, you know, I, I think until <laughs> until there's 50 years more, worse, more development of cell phone technology and there can actually be legit heads up displays that are projected onto your retinas. Um, and then you could just run an app that manages all this shit and just broadcast that info to everybody until that becomes reality. I don't think this is, I don't think this is viable. I just think that the logistics are just too complex. Yeah. And um, the thing is there are logistics that are already existent in, um, some campaign games. So that's why this sort of thing can work like the hard scrabble setting work a little better in those games whereas it doesn't work so well in a in a more pvp focused high fatality game well well the ability of a campaign game to centralize things yeah um is the is the big to have a centralized physical location so you know in dead legends there's the the saloon um but this this the idea of that there's a player base or a town or whatever that lets you do a lot more um that lets you have a lot more control of what everyone is doing. And I th think, I think, uh, how would this work in a medieval uh, PVE game? So let's say same, same starting point. You start, everyone starts with swords. Right. Um, and you want to make this Hmm. how would this how would this work how would you how would you without assuming you can't just butcher your players that's the big thing assuming you can't right. just butcher your players uh, because they have persistent characters and complete slaughter is generally frowned upon um you need enough npcs to be a threat i think is, is something yeah i mean that's that's actually actually if you're making this hard scrabble and you're limiting what the players have access to you don't need as many npcs to be a threat because the npcs can outgear the players that's true if everyone's starting off with swords but the npcs may have you know shields bows Pull arms spears, yeah. yeah uh and as long as you're not, as long as you're keeping magic under control um you actually don't need as many npcs um how would you how would you create that because it's it, it is bullshit to have a minecraft effect where you whap someone 20 times and then your sword breaks yeah that's some bullshit <laughs> um that's bullshit in minecraft <laughs> um 
Hmm. Not sure. Uh, I mean, you could have. What well, are we assuming this is a campaign or a one off? Either. Okay, so as a campaign, I think the decay rules from Dead Legends would. Yeah, um, so like, I, I would agree. It's not going to break after hitting that zombie 20 times, but after three months of hitting zombies, sure, your sword's not what it once was. So for, yeah. for, for like, gear scarcity, the, the time delay, I think, is a decent system. Well, Malleus has that upkeep system, which, which might be really interesting. Malleus I might actually be kind of have this, this vibe. I specifically avoided bringing it up because we haven't, well, I haven't played it for real yet. And I mean, I haven't played it with the upkeep, with where the upkeep comes into play. So Right. But yeah, no, from, from what I have read of the rules, I, I think Malleus could be a contender for, for this kind of uh, atmospheric. Maybe that's what you need to do. Um, so, uh, so to bring everyone up to speed on what we're talking about, um, the game Malleus, which was supposed to debut this year, uh, loosely based off the Mordheim, Mordheim game in the Warhammer universe, um, it has an upkeep system where, um, <clears throat> where depending on how much of the uh, not glowstone you acquire for your faction, um, you can get more or less upkeep. Um, and upkeep lets you bring weapons into the game. Upkeep, upkeep lets you bring gear into the game. So, um, so my character is running with full armor, a helmet, and a pole arm. Um, that's three points of upkeep for the armor, one for the helmet, and I think two for the pole arm. Um, so my character needs six points of upkeep every game just to bring that gear onto the field. Yeah, I think mine was like a crossbow, a set of quarrels, a knife, and I think maybe the armor as well. Uh, but yeah, the crossbow eats up a good chunk of it. Um, and the idea is you, you can craft weapons and craft gear in game, but if you don't have the upkeep for it, it goes away in between between games. Um, so that that's that might create that, that dynamic. I don't know. We, we haven't played with it yet, as we said. So I think it has a good chance. Um, we'll see. We'll see if that if that creates that hard scrabble dynamic. So I think this might be a good point to wrap it up. I think so. We're we're drawn close to two hours, and uh, I, I have been a bit under the weather lately. So we started off with Star Wars. We we were always going to lead it back to to gaming. Um, we, we're trying to to kind of broaden our approach a little bit. We don't just always want to talk about hitting people with sticks. Um, there, there's other forms of the basic idea behind fighting words is any sort of competitive or cooperative combat. That could be shooty games. That can be mostly we've been talking about LARP and, and medieval stuff. Um, but back when I first started it, I did want to talk about like Airsoft, which we were playing at the time. I haven't really played much since because they closed the place we used to play. Um, but also like different co-op games that we play with people online, stuff like that. Um, and we'll just we'll just see how things go. Try and explore a few different topics. But uh, today we started with Star Wars. We led it back to games, and I think that's uh, a good sum up. Yeah, I think so. So I'm Tycho, and these have been fighting words. <laughs>